I want to, uh, it, that tied it all up, um, but to, uh, you know, quote Dalali, we got to turn this from like that high level to how do we operationalize this. And I just want to give a couple examples of how you can get started. Um, and I've got people at a wide range in their journey. Some haven't even started, and some are at like pretty large scale. So I'm going to try and cover both of those use cases. Bear with me. I'm also, based on what people have said, I'm going to change my talking track on the fly here. So I might skip several slides. All right. So first, we do have to start with the why. Uh, I got accused recently of um, engaging in, in deepities. Um, and, and what the person was saying is like, hey, man, every time these conversations come up, you go straight to like values and first principles. And that's because I think often the processes that we're using, the decisions we make, can't be traced back to first principles and values. So you definitely still need to do that. But th this person was right. Like, we, we can't live there. Right? We have to very quickly go from why to first, what are the outcomes that we want to achieve? Right? In, in the diagram that I showed you, the why is the impact. Right? Josh Marcus nailed that. Then Gene talked to us about what are the DevOps outcomes we're looking for. And I also told you that the mission outcomes are yours. We can't stand up in the stage and, and equalize mission outcomes, but those are more important than the DevOps outcomes. As Paul said, we should stop talking about DevOps and start talking about the continuous delivery of value that users actually love. And we talked about a lot of stuff, as Paul said. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm staring at a pile of Legos. And I really want to bring it back um, to something I said much earlier on day one. Uh, and I wanted to properly attribute, um, I highly recommend this talk. He's given it several places. But Jez Humble, continuous delivery sounds great, but it won't work here. Um, and I want to remind you, he said, uh, these stated reasons were regulated. We're not building websites. Too much legacy. Our people are too stupid. We say that one way too much in government. And, uh, you know, like, what about the boats? All kinds of other crazy things. Um, but the real reasons are that our culture, uh, maybe I'll have to be more uh, precise when I say this, our software delivery culture sucks. Uh, and our architecture to do that sucks. And we've got to be honest about that if we're going to change it, um, to, to reference something that Paul uh, Gaffney said. And so I'm going to be prescriptive on something here. I mentioned earlier in my culture talk with Dalali that uh, like leaders should probably get coaches. But I think we can all use uh, some coaching, right? We've never done this before. And I'm going to go out on the golf course in front of like uh, people that I care about and want to think highly of me, and like uh, I'm a terrible golfer. I have Matt do that. He's my uh, COO. He's he's the business guy. He takes the business meetings on the golf course. I do not. But I'm gonna go get a coach. And people have never done DevOps before, and they're not getting coaches. And not only that, but the practitioners haven't done it either. And so I want to highlight uh, this from the culture brief that I gave uh, again with the Lolly that we have to change thinking. Or sorry, uh, we can't try to change thinking. We can't give people computer-based trainings uh, on how you should do DevOps, um, you know, how you should do cybersecurity, even continuous ATO, a topic that I'm really passionate about, and certainly not about culture. Here's the values you should have. You know, like we, uh, the craziest one to me is always things like sexual assault, really serious issue. You think you're really gonna like just tell somebody like don't do that? Is that an effective? No, absolutely not. And so this story of Numi really gets to the heart of the matter, which is you got some of the worst culture that we've ever seen in auto manufacturing and almost overnight transformed into the highest performing auto manufacturing plant in the United States. It took less than three months. And it was never replicated by another American auto manufacturer. They changed behavior to change thinking. They took them into the Toyota production system and they said, come and work with us in a different way. And they didn't say anything else. And when people saw the results of working in a different way, the outcomes, that's what changed their values, that's what changed their beliefs. And so I would ask you, like, do you have a Toyota production system? Do you have a place that you can take people? Often we don't. You might. There might be an enterprise cloud offering. Like I think Army is starting to build up what I would call a, at least the technical side of the Toyota production system with executive cloud management agency. Um, but you need a place to take people where they can do things differently and see the outcomes of that. It's going to be physically separated, most likely. Um, and they're, they're going to have a very different reporting structure, which I'll talk about in a minute. The next question, then, is who is your Toyota? Again, you might be able to do this internally. We get like crazy talent that comes through, the digital services and the PIF um, and, and other organizations. And if you can get that talent, I would say, like, don't rely on a contractor. But by all means, don't think that all contractors are just out for greedy profits. 
There are people that specialize in this. Pivotal Labs was one of them. I can't tell you the number of times they had this, uh, their core values were um, do the right thing, do what works, and always be kind. And you could feel that in every interaction with them. Did they get everything right? No. They didn't know our domain. There were, there were issues. I could point to issues. I'm not, I'm not here to say they were perfect. But what they were really good at is bringing us into this new way of working. I don't think that Kessel Run and several other software factories exist if we hadn't had that experience of sending government folks into a Toyota production system with a Toyota, in this case Pivotal, uh, and their path to prod for us, and being able to experience what it's like to work in a different way and see those results. That's great, you've got people uh, helping your developers, your designers, your product managers, maybe your platform people, dojos. Where are all the leadership coaches? I mentioned uh, Trillion Dollar Coach, highly recommend that book if you, um, you know, are struggling with a senior leader. I, I, again, if Eric Schmidt and Steve Jobs needed a coach, the same coach, by the way, um, to pull off what they did, then every single one of us probably could use a coach. The next question is, can you address all of the cross-functionals that are needed, right? So it's not just getting the, uh, you know, we focused more on the, the technology side right there, and the Toyota production system really makes you think of manufacturing and technology, but you need to be able to address acquisitions. You need to be able to address funding. But you can't fit all of that in your head. Dan North has this concept of software that fits in your head. Um, I think you have to think about your organization that way. It's like the organizational debt that can fit in your head. And you have a lot of organizational debt right now. We all do. And we can't fit all that in your head. So you have to have those small execution teams armed with outcomes to go fix all those problems. Don't try to fix procurement yourself. Put a team in charge of that. Tell them the outcome you want. They're going to fail. Most likely, a couple first times, or maybe not fail, but you know, I thought we did really good. I've mentioned this a couple times, and when I got to see the results of my own work as a contractor, it was not great, right? Still a lot of room for improvement. All right, so that brings us to architecture. Um, I want to address this first, uh, you know, the two problems we need to focus on, architecture and culture. Uh, man, this software factory term really gets me, so I, I felt like I needed to address it. Let's, like, maybe figure out a different word. I don't care what it is. Um, but it's the combination of the people, the process, and the technology that provides the ideal conditions for continuously delivering valuable software to end users with minimal waste, right? That's what factories essentially do. And it's important because it's not just the platform. That's not, that's not the factory. I think people conflate like, hey, the assembly line. Like, oh, the platform's like an assembly line, so it's the factory. No, what good is a factory with no people in it? What good's a factory with no processes? So whatever we call this thing, I don't care what it is, we have to address people, process, and technology architecture. That's weird, right? Normally we talk about technology architectures, but um, we've talked a lot about how to organize for success. Good grief, don't start here. The number of times people reach out to me and they're like, hey, you started Kessel Run. I, man, I, I really, you had all these talented people. Like, I need to hire, um, and I'm sorry, this is a little blurry. The, the things on here are relevant. The point is it's a lot. They're like, I need to hire a chief data architect. I need a CTO. I need a CIO, all before they get started. It's a lot like safe implementations. Um, I, I don't take as much issue with safe. I think safe is op often implemented really poorly. I don't know if it can be implemented well, but I won't go there. But well, one thing that I see is organizations will hire 20 architects before they have a single software developer. That's the real problem. They're, they're, and people are trying to do this. Like, I want to replicate Kessel Run. So they look at Kessel Run. They're like, oh, Kessel Run has a CTO. We need a CTO. And they hire that person first. That's probably not a great idea. Instead, what I would advocate for is some kind of scaling pattern. Um, the focus, as Paul uh, Puckett said, shouldn't be on scaling fast uh, or too fast. You have to be careful about how quickly you scale, but there is a timing element here. If you don't scale fast enough, you'll get crushed by the bureaucracy. If you try to scale too fast, you'll crush under the weight of all the things that you have to do. It's a difficult balance. I don't know what to tell you other than like, you're going to have to learn your way through it. But notice here, we start with maybe one to two product teams. I use product teams because we do software, but I really like the story of the green folders with the barcode. That could be your first product provides immense value, right? And you'll notice on here, like, I've identified a, a big problem that I see a lot, um, which on these first two teams is the CEO and the COO. There's this unique thing about Kessel Run. Uh, Adam Furtado rose to all sorts of leadership positions in Kessel Run. He started as a product designer on the first team, or one of the first teams. Um, and I think that was really important. You can't hire your way out of this problem. I know we talked about, like, how do we get talent into, uh, from, from commercial, but Nick mentioned like, hey, you, you got to pair them with the government folks. 
right? You can't just replace the government folks. You've got to pair them with the government folks. And when you do that, you have to be really careful about making sure the people that are going to lead this organization have the expertise to do so. That might not mean they need to spend, be on the first team like very directly. I actually wasn't on a team. Um, but I do think it's important um, that we, especially when we're bringing leaders into the organization, they do rotations. If you go to an organization like, uh, I know a lot of folks in the military will apply to USAA. USAA, um, one of the first things they do when they hire veterans is they put, the, even very senior veterans, by the way, um, they put them through like basically the, the factory floor. Like you're gonna go work here, you're gonna go work here, you're gonna learn to understand not just the user's problems, but also our employees' problems and the employee experience. And I think that's really important um, because it's too easy to get out of touch when you get to that thing on the right if you, if you ever get there. Um, the question here then is, are you organized for success? Call back to uh, Max and uh, Admiral Richardson this morning. You need to have the authorities and the proximity to the user. That gets you the privilege of being able to be accountable for something. Then we actually have to start holding people accountable. And so the question becomes, how fast can you learn? This more than anything, I don't, you know, I'll go into some specific metrics. But the question you should always be asking yourself, however you measure it, is how quickly am I learning? Everything that we're doing, every single aspect, is about learning. Every single, I'm going to say that again, every single aspect. That contract that you let, you should be thinking about what are you going to learn from that? Because it's not perfect. I made this mistake, too, several times. It's easy to fall into that trap. But you have to, with everything that you do, figure out how quickly can you learn. And the only way you can do that is if you can get things into prod. Prod for a contract uh, might be an executed document, right? Um, prod, same for an RFI, an RFP. Until you get those things out in the wild, you can't learn. We can sit and talk about all the acquisition strategies in the world. And um, at the end of the day, you got to do it and learn from it. Because not everything's going to work for you in the way that it worked for somebody else. That brings me then to continuous delivery. Man, continuous delivery, Paul Puckett mentioned this a couple times. Um, you know, this, this isn't the, the end all, this isn't the goal. The goal uh, behind continuous delivery is to be able to find value. And I wanna say something else about it. Um, so this is your feedback loop. And continuous delivery doesn't just apply to software, it applies to every one of our functionals as well. We should be thinking how we can get into a state of continuous delivery where we're putting things out learning from them or validating them. If we don't validate things, we build up a ton of risk over time. If we can quickly validate things, we can keep that risk curve low. Continuous delivery is actually an exercise in risk reduction. Yes, people are still going to be taking risks, but we practice risk avoidance today or risk ignorance. We don't know all the risks we're taking. It's the, the age-old problem of Bastiat and you know that which is seen, that which is unseen. We see uh, the risks of the new system, we don't see the risks or the unintended consequences of the current system. So focus on that. Then you're going to have some software goals. Uh, we talked about increasing mission capability, you know, some mission metric that matters that's unique to you or some level of your organization. And remember that the state of DevOps r goes into uh, defining that um, delivering software quickly, reliably, and safely uh, results in two times uh, higher mission outcomes um, and they research not just commercial organizations, but mission-driven organizations. And so at the end of the day, you're going to get to something like this, right? And this is talking about how quickly, again, you can learn. How quick can you get it out there? How stable is it, right? You can't get much feedback if your thing's always broken. You got feedback that it's broken, but you're not getting fee uh, feedback on the value of it. Um, how available is it? Uh, and putting that together with the mission metric that matters. And Paul uh, Gaffney talked about, and it's having two Pauls, I keep having to say last names. Uh, he talked about alignment, and I want to talk about the alignment trap that can happen. It often happens with SAFE, um, but I've seen it happen elsewhere as well. And that's focusing on alignment before you have the ability to get feedback. You will spend all of your time and money in boardrooms discussing what you think value is, and you have no way to validate it. So, the number one thing I would tell you about architecture, however, whatever technologies you choose, um, make sure that your approach is about delivery first. I don't care if the thing is valuable. I actually don't care if it's a good bet, by the way. The, the, the first experiment that you're making is, can I get a line of code into production? There's inherent value in that. 
So you want to rapidly experiment with low cost of delay. Uh, Taleb talks about this uh, in Black Swan as being able to quickly cycle through small errors. So we've, again, reduced tail risk, actually, until we find those big discoveries. Tanker Planner was one. We did make some bad bets at Kessel Run, but we, we knew they were bad bets. We found them out very quickly. Leon Kaplan, uh, is she still here? There he is back there. Leon was one of the earliest uh, team members at Kessel Run. I have to imagine he's the longest standing Kessel Runner. Um, but he was on one of the first teams, and, and one of the first teams that failed. It was actually our second team after Tanker Planner. Um, and within four weeks, it was actually a replatform, a brownfield. We, we replatformed it, no user value. Canceled it, moved all the money into another project, uh, and that one failed too. This one had value, but we weren't organized for success. We didn't have the authorities we needed to integrate with the joint targeting and joint intelligence community, and it failed. And we kept cycling quickly through these small bets. Yeah, they were bad bets, but they were small. We didn't lose a lot of money on them. You know, on that first one, we lost you know, less than six figures. I don't know if I can say the amounts. The second one was a little bit more than that, um, but it was a whole lot better than spending 10 years and, and uh, you know, $500 million like AOC 10.1. Right, that's the real risk. All right, also have to architect with some kind of platform. Where you fall on this, there's lots of debate. I don't want to get into the debates on, on how much you should abstract away from your developers. But just know this, whatever you choose to manage, you own. And owning it comes with a few things. There's a cost of development. You have to develop the thing that you own if you're going to deploy all your own services. Even if you're using open source or you're going to configure together a bunch of AWS services, somebody has to do that engineering work. Then they have to do it on day two, when you have to patch it and upgrade it and maintain it. That's the cost of operations. And measuring it on day two is absolutely necessary. Most of the government programs I work with are notorious for measuring getting Hello World to some Kubernetes platform and then building a cost model off of that. It is exponential cost growth when you're managing all the teams that are managing all of this. And you don't have to pay that when you use AWS or VMware Tanzu uh, or any of these other platforms. You get an economy of scale because you're paying for it, you're paying for it, you're paying for it, you're paying for it. And that economy of scale lets you focus on whatever it is that's important to you. I hope it's applications and data. That's Brian's opinion. Some people will go a little lower, but just know there's a cost to develop, a cost to operate, and a cost to comply. Angel and I hit this pretty hard. Whatever you bring, you are also bringing the controls for, and you're responsible for updating and maintaining those controls and continuous monitoring. Remember, continuous ATO is not avoiding RMF. It's RMF on steroids. It's doing RMF all the time, every day, every minute of every day. And you're going to be responsible for 1,300 controls. You know, this is a particular overlay for, for secret level work in the DoD. But even in federal, at like a medium or a high, you know, you're often in the like 700 range. I mean, when you go up to TS or some other special mission use cases, you get these crazy overlays. You're responsible for all of that. And so continuous uh, authority to operate, again, is it goes beyond RMF, I would say, in ways, um, or at least the way that we've chosen to implement it over and over again, in that you're not just building pipelines. It's not just pipelines. You have to work quality and security into your processes for build, for dev, even for your talent management process, and then push it right of your pipeline right into the operations environment and having that continuous uh, monitoring. These are the kinds of things that we need to architect for. And people have solved these problems and they've solved them for multiple paths to production. So don't try and recreate this. Find somebody who's actually done it, like actually done it, really shipping things to prod with like full documentation, not fake documentation and memos, and find them and learn from them. All right, finally, the way. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip some slides here because Paul Gaffney crushed it uh, on some of these things. So um, let's start with kind of a pictorial representation of I think what I, I heard Paul talk about. And when you start, it might not look like this. So if you're a new start, remember I said start with one or two teams. And that team's probably going to report directly, maybe directly to the executive. Or at least Paul is out there saying, hey, you know, like uh, talking to whoever these stakeholders might be and saying like, hey, I want this team to be able to talk directly to the customers at Home Depot. Um, but eventually, it's complex. Home Depot's huge, the DOD is huge, federal government is huge. And so you're gonna have this executive team looking at opportunities, okay? Um, problem statements and opportunities. And 
they might, there might be some feedback mechanism. I'm open to how you do this. People like cascade OKRs. Other people like never cascade OKRs. I don't, I don't really care. But the, the idea here is that every single one of these people is centered around the user or the customer, and they're all looking at the same metrics. That's the biggest thing, the most important thing that I can say to you. No matter how many layers you add, if you add a layer between the user and them, there's a problem. And it might not be them actually talking to the user, but they can see and, and measure uh, or see the measurements, make the work visible, um, they can see that for the users. What's also in here is growth boards. Um, key is a little small here, but that middle one, those are growth boards. There's way too many in here. Uh, I just had to make it look pretty. Um, but one thing that's important is, you know, there should be very few at the executive level. Um, and I think, like, as you, you uh, go down, if you do use a cascade, um, those might increase in frequency, but don't make too many of them. Um, I think that if you can, I would consolidate. I would actually try to have just one if you can get through it. And I would challenge you to reduce as many as you can because it is a layer of bureaucracy. But what's important is these growth boards in this new way, everyone has the same rules. There's different levels of fidelity, opacity, risk, complexity. All right? There's a lean government uh, model throughout. You have to make sure it's lean. Uh, and the growth boards, they make this work, but only if uh, you have a few key characteristics. So it might serve one or multiple teams. It has to be cross-functional, again, in representation. And what we're doing here is we're taking an entrepreneurial approach, right? Very similar to VCs. This is modeled after a VC model. If you go to a VC and you take money, they say, meet back up with me in a quarter, and I'm going to see how you spent my money and if I want to give you more money. You don't just get, you know, like we do in, in government, zombie projects, entitlement funding. You just get your money. No, actually meter the money. And I can talk to you about how you can do that from a financial perspective. Uh, Eric Lofgren talked about BPACs and PEs. They're similar across other areas of federal. But making sure that you can move your money around so when you do make bad bets, um, you can reallocate money into teams that found really good opportunities and figured out ways to solve them. Um, I wanted to say one more about this. They do not make product level decisions. They only set the outcomes. Super important. And those should be based around measurable, in our case, mission metrics. All right. Again, how do we measure mission success and viability of the investments that we're making? Because that's what they are. When would we expect to see returns on those investments? It's important to set that. Right? It might be a quarter. Everybody's like, oh, I'm going to do quarterly growth boards. There might be some things in your organization that you need to do maybe monthly. There might be other things that don't lend themselves well to a quarter. Um, you still have the growth board, but everybody knows that that person is hitting that outcome at a later date, and we can measure progress. Another one that I like in here is what would we observe to cause us to invest more or less? This is something, again, we, we don't do a great job of in government. We have zombie projects. They just lumber on. Um, and they take all the money and the resources, and there's none left over for anybody else. So figure out how to make those decisions. All right, I'm going to go a little bit faster here because I want to get through these. Um, one thing that I think is super important, I'll be sharing these slides. People have asked a number of times. We'll be sharing slides um, after the event, uh, so you'll have access to these. But one other really important thing that I think gets overlooked in these is we fund teams and problems not ideas and solutions. And uh, Safi Bacall wrote Loon Shots, fantastic book. He describes uh, this problem, or you know, the problem that we're talking about here, as the Moses trap, where the leader comes down from on high and parts the Red Seas for their chosen uh, people, and then we push that through to prod, and we don't actually, uh, or sorry, we push that through the funding process, we give that all the money, and we aren't actually um, looking at the problems and whether or not we solve them. It's just our chosen pet projects. Growth boards are not member managing ideas. They establish the permissions needed to optimize growth. So this again goes to the leadership mindset that Paul talked about and the, the difference in the shift of power. All right, this is DOD version. You could apply this to your own processes. I would encourage you to do it though at some point. It needs to be a lot more detailed than this. We have more detailed versions. But we took all these things that we do including growth boards, and said, how does this align to the DOD requirements process, the funding process, and the defense acquisition system? We make our thing look like their thing. Some of the things might go away. We might say, like, hey, we shouldn't do these program review boards, or we shouldn't do a milestone B. But we said, like, hey, 
An inception growth board on a new greenfield project, that's a lot like a milestone B, if you're familiar with like acquisition speak. So let's just replace milestone reviews with a growth board. And that growth board is very different because it's about inception, we're just starting the project, then the launch growth board, and then the quarterly one after we've delivered into production. And the other thing that we can highlight when we do this, and we do this in continuous ATO and everything else, we say, we're giving you more information than you've ever had before at a more frequent cadence with more transparency and honesty. And you have to do that. I think, especially early on, it's a valid fear that people will weaponize transparency. And so you should keep this protected in some way, whatever protection you need based on who might be on the attack, um, but you have to be able to have those difficult conversations. All right, last thing before I talk about the call to action. Shaping the enterprise experience. This is kind of a new concept. Um, oh man, transitioning to PowerPoint really killed this here, but um, in the middle there, we've got a transformational leader. Gene, uh, at the end of yesterday, gave us all the characteristics of a transformational leader. Um, I'm still working this out, so this is, this is a work in progress, but the idea here is that um, you have to manage the employee experience, the customer experience, and the shareholder experience as you're managing change. Three experiences. You could measure them with net promoter scores. It'd be interesting to get stakeholder net promoter scores. Uh, just focus on improvement, not initial baseline. Um, and the question is, where do I start? A lot of folks want to start with the shareholder experience. They do budget pageants. Um, they do all kinds of like pandering, um, and they never get anywhere. Other people try to get to a customer experience, um, but to get there, they're like, oh, I need all this money, I need all these resources, and they go pitch, and they don't get the money and the resources. What every change agent that I've seen that successful does is they start um, at the employee experience, but in a unique way. They ask those first followers, who if you identify them correctly on the diffusion of innovation curve, these are your innovators, those are the people you want to find. They will happily eat crap for a month for the mission, for three months, for a year, for three years. They're gluttons for punishment. It's a lot of you in this room. Uh, you've stayed in government and you just keep doing it. They will do that and they will produce a really great customer experience with almost nothing. It's like MacGyver. They get like some duct tape and a gum wrapper and they figure out how to create value. That's the story of the green folder with the barcode. Right? I'm going to figure out a way with the resources that I have to create value, and I might have to ask people. You know, you're, you're like starting this new visionary thing. I'm going to start a software factory. And you're like getting everybody pumped up. Nobody wants to be like, and actually, it's really going to suck for the first year. Everybody's like focused on, oh, it's going to be so great. We're going to be heroes. Everybody's going to love us. They still don't love me. I'm just going to put that out there. There's lots of people that still don't like me. Um, and it will be that case for you as well. You have to focus on finding those people who come on that journey with you and then move through the division, uh, diffusion of innovation curve. And an important note there, the frozen middle is not in the middle of the org chart. It's in the middle of that diffusion of innovation. It's your early, uh, sorry, your late majority uh, primarily. And why I say that is because they can exist at any level in the organization. You will find them on grassroots teams. And sometimes they're hard to spot too because they're surrounded by a bunch of like innovators, hoorah, and they're a little bit quieter. You have to figure out how to sort that out. And I'm, people disagree with me here, but I'll tell you, ignore the people that are farther along in the innovation curve. And here's why. Jeff Moore in Crossing the Chasm, he said, look, you can never market to a group whose expectations you can't meet. That's a recipe for product failure. And you should never market to two groups at once. Successful product companies figure out they market to the early adopters, those innovators that'll go buy an iPhone no matter how much it sucks and how many bugs there are in the first round and that it's you know, a year behind Galaxy. They'll go do it because they're like bought in. And you keep marketing uh, your way to bring in all of those adopters. And uh, if you don't realize that you're talking to people who are late majority or even early majority, you can't meet their expectations. And you shouldn't. You shouldn't try. If you were trying to, you would have to lie to them. Now, Paul uh, Puckett said something important, like they might be in chapter five of your story and you should tell them that they're going to be, but you should be really honest about like, I can't meet your expectations. I can't meet your expectations. I can't build the whole thing and deploy it for you. But I can build these three things and then I'm gonna build four. And on chapter four, you're gonna come in and I'm gonna try and meet your expectations. And then the last thing that I'll say um, about all of this is 
measure it. Um, and actually, before I do that, I want, I want to say one more thing. So we've created a great customer experience with all these innovators. We scaled it by pulling in the diffusion of innovation curve. And every time we turn that wheel, we have to take the things that we've built and go to our stakeholders and get more resources. And this is where I see a lot of times, I had a conversation during break, had an early conversation with Will Roper during Kessel Run, uh, where we talked about like, is it really thriving or is it barely surviving, right? Kessel Run's this flame, like we stoked it into a flame and he was like, I see embers. That's what Will Roper said to me. This was like a year and a half into the journey. He said, I see embers that people are trying to snuff out. And so one thing that we hadn't done a great job of is taking that customer experience that we were creating and figure out what our shareholders actually cared about. We thought it was mission success. It might not be. For some of them it was, and we found those people, they were our greatest champions, but there were way more naysayers. They cared about their promotions. They cared about their influence. We can hate that all we want, or we can just live with it and figure out how to deal with it. So create a great shareholder experience. If somebody wants uh, to get promoted, or they're, they're, you know, they want to have project success, they want their outcomes met, and they're not the one that has to meet them all and, and dictate everything, figure out how to do that for them. And you can use those resources to create a really great employee experience and keep pulling in people along that innovation curve. All right, last thing on that, you really need to measure. The simplest thing you can do, like for platforms, for instance, get a customer net promoter score. I wish that the DoD would adopt customer net promoter scores for all these platforms that are being built. Do the customers actually like it? Anonymous surveys, because there's a lot of power. There's the Moses trap. We have Moses coming down from high and saying, like, thou shalt use this platform. Let's get some anonymous feedback on the net promoter score of some of these capabilities. And do it internal to your organization. If your organization is building a platform, I know there's some of them in here, figure out what the net promoter score is. It'll be very enlightening. All right, call to action. Um, I really like Paul's analogy uh, about uh, you know, bringing somebody to church for the first time. I don't know if I want to go with a church analogy for prodacity, but bring, bring those people next year. Bring other people that need to hear this message. Uh, bring your bosses. They probably need to hear it the most. Um, next, though, we're going to ship our first thing together. So uh, if you could take that paper that you have um, and start folding it. It's going to be a little hard to fold in your lap, but that's okay. There's instructions, but I don't know if you'll need them if you're a like, pro paper airplane folder. Um, so the goal for Prodacity 2022 is to set a baseline for how to do DevOps in government and achieve mission outcomes. We wanted attendees to learn how to launch, scale, and or continuously improve if you're far along in your journey. The next generation of government software organizations, whatever we call them, maybe not factories. And we wanted you to have some of the lessons learned to do it better, faster, and cheaper. Still a lot of work to be done, but hopefully we've armed you with the, the information and some of the patterns that you need to get there. Um, I want you all to join our Slack community. Um, we're going to ask each of you to uh, set some goals for next year uh, within your organization, some of those like mission outcomes, or maybe they're more strictly focused on DevOps outcomes. And uh, next year, we want you to come back to Prodacity 2023 with your friends and your bosses. Uh, and we want to report back on how we did as a community. We're going to use that community. Um, I really want to keep sales out of there. Please, if you're a vendor, no sales in the channel. If somebody wants your goods, they'll reach out to you. Uh, but provide help, not sales pitches. Right? Help people. If you're another government organization, help people. It can be formal. It can be informal. Maybe you go join their team. Hopefully, people found some people to connect with, network with, find new teams because they had horrible bosses, like Gaffney said. Um, but what I really want, then, is also, for some of you to consider coming back and speaking next year, stay tuned for announcements. We haven't figured out if we're going to stick with one track. It's going to be based on the feedback that you all give. Um, but we want to have uh, some folks report back on their experience reports, how they use this information. We're also going to have some smaller events now and then. We're going to put on some virtual events. Uh, we might do little pop-ups in cities that are uh, closer to folks. So again, stay tuned for all of that. Um, the calls for speakers and attendees. I want to. Uh, Thank you all for coming out. I'm trying to stall. We're getting close. Um, but really, I, I, I hope that you use that channel. There's some great people, like the speakers are going to be in that channel. Um, you know, like many uh, important folks, their time is limited, but hopefully you're able to like leverage them and continue leveraging them and their expertise. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and 
uh, ship our first outcome together. Who's got their plane? Listen, if you don't have your plane, hey, just ship it anyways. If you're not embarrassed by your first deploy to prod, you waited too long. I had cheated. I had somebody fold mine for me. So um, These don't actually fly very good, by the way, because they're like so uh, 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 slick. So like, don't hit anybody in front of you. Try to aim like uh, away from people and stay looking forward so we don't poke anybody's eye out, all right? I'm going to ship mine over here. All right, thank you all. I appreciate you coming out. I'm sorry if you get hit in the head. <laughs> all right, thank you, everyone.